few months I had another mutation which prevents me from walking properly. So I'm a premature entrant to the geriatrics club. Anyway, so um, a very warm thanks to the students who invited me. I hope you can hear. Yeah? No? Yeah? Okay. Um, so my comments will really be directed to the students since uh, presumably you invited me to hear about my path and all of you still have to figure out your path and maybe the, there'll be something you can learn from that. Uh, just a few uh, words of caution. Uh, I have a sort of hereditary problem of getting very emotional uh, during talks like this. <clears throat> so please pardon me if such moments happen. So yes, I will talk about my path and there are really three elements to it. Uh, one is my academic work, uh, one is institution building, and the third is being a woman professional. And these things will kind of, these themes will uh, inter, you know, be included in the narrative. So yes, I came to CCMB uh, to do my PhD. Uh, I think uh, the reason, it was an active decision to continue in science, to do science, but it was also a little bit carrying on the family tradition in the sense that my father was an academic. And so the idea was that one does a PhD. It wasn't, uh, you know, it's like uh, maybe if you're from a medical family, you want to do, become a doctor, a lawyer's child wants to become a lawyer. So in that sense, yes, one did a PhD. But I think two to three years into the PhD, I remember feeling, you know, I'm not really interested in this. And I told Nagraj that, and I think he was a little surprised. Uh, I was doing okay in the lab. Uh, there was no reason for me not to continue. But I realized I wasn't really interested. Uh, but, you know, you want to, one wants to finish something. It's, I think it's uh, not, uh, there, there are times when one may wish to drop out, and there may be good reasons for that. But generally, I would say it's good to complete what one has uh, started. So I finished uh, the PhD. And by then I was married uh, to a childhood friend, Upi Bhalla, he's at NCBS. And he said, no, no, you must do a postdoc. And you have what it takes and you must do a postdoc. So I felt, okay, you know, if you've been doing something for a few years, it's difficult, it's a big decision to stop doing what you've been doing. So I said, all right, I'll do a postdoc. So we went to New York and I was in the Cornell Medical School and after about six months, I remember sitting on a sofa at home on a Sunday reading about pota potassium channels, some paper, and I realized, you know, I didn't care what that channel did. I said, that channel could jump out of the paper and hit me on the head and I wouldn't care. So the next day I told my guide, you know, I'm not interested. I'm really not interested, but I'm here, so if you want, I'll carry on. Uh, in Cornell because you know we, we were working on some projects maybe had gotten a grant for that otherwise I'll go back to India because I was determined to come back to India and you can't live in New York on one salary at least not in Manhattan or not easily so he said no 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 you stay here I said okay I'll stay here but I'm telling you I'm not interested I'll do the experiments but I'm not interested so it's okay you know it went on so then, you know, it came to my mind, so what do I do? Okay, we're going to go back to India, and Upi had an offer, or it seemed like he would have an offer at NCBS. So we knew we were going to go back to Bangalore. So then I said, you know, the only thing I could think of at that time was some kind of NGO work. Uh, you know, there was a very, uh, an even bigger divide between academia and industry then as there is today. There, a lot of bridges have been built since then. So we, we never thought of industry at that time. Maybe the chemistry, in fact, IICT, I think, uh, had much closer relationship with industry even then. But uh, bio, there was hardly any discussion. Uh, and I couldn't think you know, what else? So, okay, some NGO and I have those tendencies anyway, non-profit oriented. So, I said, you know, if I'm going to work in an NGO, I'd better learn Kannada because, you know, you're going to a state and a lot of work will be with local people, local language. So, I sat down in New York and started learning Kannada. So I got my parents to send me this really fat dictionary. There was a Reverend Kittel dictionary, incredible. And then there were these children's books produced by the Children's Book Trust, National Book Trust, where a given story would be translated into multiple languages. So I told them, send me a st stories in Kannada and send me either the English or Hindi versions. So I would sit there and, you know, figure out what it was. So just so you know, the, the alphabet in Kannada is very much similar to Hindi, except that the script is different. There are a lot of ducks, and I learned how to write all those ducks. So I, uh, you know, learned to read and write and built up a certain vocabulary. And I felt, you know, I'm, I'm taking proactive steps 
for my future career. So then we came back, uh, and um, meanwhile, um, we had a family friend, uh, Gandhian, a friend of the family from the 50s, my father's friend. And I wrote to him, his name is Vasant Palshikar. And I wrote to him asking him for advice. I said, tell me what uh, I should do. And he was an oddball and I realized there were two oddballs who influenced me very much. Uh, Vasant Palshikar did not even have a college education. His wife had a PhD. She taught in some college system in Maharashtra and they moved around. But he was kind of an in intellectual at large. And uh, he used to write in Marathi. I think he read whatever money they had they spent on books. My father said if you go to their house it's like a radhi shop. They're just books piled one after the other. There was no money for bookcases but there, were, there was money for books. And he would translate into Marathi, you know, probably for people who weren't reading in English. And I heard that later NRI Maharashtrians gave him an award for what he had done. So I wrote to him and he said, um, okay, you want to do NGOs, that's fine. Sample different NGOs. Uh, don't uh, decide too quickly. And that is some advice I would give even today. Uh, you, you know, you, you need to sort of, each NGO is different and you have to see whether or not you're a good fit, both with the theme and with the personalities in that NGO. So I started doing that and I said, okay, six weeks. Six weeks is my limit. I'm going to spend six weeks each in multiple NGOs. Uh, and I did that. So at that time, NCBS was um, on the corner of the ISC campus, a small building there before its own campus was ready. And I used to hang out there. I had my kinetic Honda and I would zip around going here and there. And then I always ended up there because that's the atmosphere I liked and that's what I was used to. And then NCBS started asking me to do things. So there was a big international workshop in 96, I remember October 96, which I managed pretty much single-handedly till the last few days. Later, annual reports, I don't know, you would have seen NCBS annual reports, very fancy documents. So I produced the first of those fancy ones by working with a very expensive designer, uh, and they must have put a lot of money into it. So I did a bit of that kind of work. Today we would call it the um, development office, institute development office or whatever. At that time that concept wasn't so strong but uh, I was the head and sole member of the institute development office. Um, then after a while I got bored and I said, you know, I don't know, I don't want to do this. Uh, enough. I did two annual reports and I said enough. So then what next? I went back to the NGOs. Um, and then after a while I figured I'm not a good fit with NGOs uh, because, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm too westernized or maybe, you know, NGOs tend to be underfunded, so every small thing takes a long time and I like things to move and whatever. I decided I'm not interested or I'm not a good fit. I'm interested but I'm not a good fit. So, okay, so what's to be done? Now at that point uh, I had a lucky break and there's a CCMB connection there. Uh, Professor Sharad Chandra came as the director towards the end of my PhD and I sort of got to know him a little bit uh, and he came from IISC, he was a professor there and he was setting up a new center, Center for Human Genetics and he knew I was there on campus and he had taken my help in their formation document, putting together the formation document for CHG. And so then uh, as an accident it turned out, the idea of IBAB uh, came, came about. So what I understand is he went around trying to raise funds for the Center for Human Genetics and he went to meet Kiran Mazumdar and this was a time when there was a huge hype about bioinformatics, uh, you know, around 2000, the Human Genome Project and all that um, and Time and Newsweek and all these people, you know, everyone had bioinformatics on the cover page uh, and I think Bangalore being such a hub of the IT industry, people felt, okay, maybe we can do something now in the bio arena. Uh, so we need to set up an institute to train people in this area uh, and uh, so we should have a, an institute of this sort. And so I think Professor Sharachandra was a little baffled because he went to seek support for his institute and a new institute was born and I don't know whether he got any support for his existing idea but uh, there was this idea of this new institute. Um, and they just announced without his permission that he was the chair of the governing body. So anyway, we call him HSC. So HSC said, Gayatri, you know, we're setting up this new institute, why don't you join? And so I said, okay, you know, at that time I was looking for an alternative. 
I don't think he knew what I was going to do. I certainly didn't know what I was going to do, but I joined. Um, now, when you start an institute, okay, now where did they put us? So, there is something called the International Tech Park in Whitefield in Bangalore. And actually, the formation of IDAB was uh, sort of mirrored after Triple IT. You have a Triple IT here, we have a Triple IT in Bangalore. And the mandate of Triple IT Bangalore, at least, was to help grow the IT industry. Uh, and basically, a, a bit of a finishing school, uh, at least initially, for IT graduates. Uh, so that they could uh, then help the growth of that headcount based industry biotech was not like was not a is not a headcount based industry but they just decided okay like triple it we'll set up something in biotech and so their literally their formation document society formation document was taken and a few words were changed and that became our formation document so I was working with the IT secretary, uh, Vivek Kulkarni, who was a pretty dynamic officer. I was working with Kiran and I was working with HSC. So I used to say it's like academia, government and industry and I'm the one stuck in the middle. And it wasn't easy. But anyway, so they put us in the international tech park because Triple IT was in the same place and they said you people will probably work together in some way. And so we were in a corner of a mall and our neighbors were, you know, not coffee day, but equivalent, restaurants, the ICICA bank, etc. And they took some time to remodel it to be an institute, so I was actually working from home for eight or nine months. So, uh, you know, anyway, so we didn't have a director, we didn't have anyone. I think Kiran hired one guy to help oversee the construction and myself, uh, and we were the institute at that time. So it was difficult to find a director. This was a very odd kind of institute. Uh, now maybe it's not so odd, but at that time, firstly we were told you had to be self-financing. This was an era where self-financing was much in the air. Even today I think uh, CSIR and everybody else is, uh, this, is a, this is a wheel which keeps turning, <laughs> that you have to earn your living. It was there even, I think PMB got exemption for CCMB uh, from that general CSIR rule, but it keeps coming back. So it was supposed to be self-financing and it had no core funding from any, we were not part of CSIR, DBT, uh, DAE, any of these departments. We were set up by the state government, by a government order of the state government. Um, there are not too many institutes uh, set up by state government which have you know, or are able to maintain an excellent reputation. So we were all already started on somewhat shaky ground. Um, but anyway, so yeah, uh, we had difficulty finding a director, but in due course, uh, Professor Manju Bansal from the MBU of ISC came. She came to us for three years. Uh, and I think Professor Sharchanda was also very surprised that he was able to persuade an ISC professor to come as director. So, you know, we muddled along. Um, we, we took certain decisions which in retrospect were strategic decisions. I remember MB, we called her MB, MB and I discussed that, you know, if we're supposed to be self-financing, the only way to do so is to have very large numbers of paying students. And already we are occupying very small space and it was not in our heart to become that kind of an institute. So we said, you know, if they want to close the institute, let them close it, but we are not going to do that. So we had 28 students in our first batch since creating manpower was one of our mandates. So growing the biotech industry was the overall vision and education, research and entrepreneurship were supposed to be the uh, ways by which we were going to do this. So the first batch, astonishingly, uh, we advertised for this postgraduate diploma in bioinformatics when you're in a offer a master's. And so it took us many years before we could offer a master's. Uh, 1,700 students applied and we were, I was absolutely amazed. We had created a website which had three pages. We had a governing body, we had I think some kind of a biosafety committee and we had, we had the announcement for admissions. There was nothing, this institute was nothing. It was basically an idea. But anyway, we begged, borrowed, stole friends, family for the admission interviews, for everything. We used to joke that by the time this institute is set up, we'll have no friends or family left. You know, the way we called people and imposed on them against their will, uh, but they helped us uh, a lot. So we recruited our first batch of 28 students and I circulated a questionnaire saying, why did you join IBAB? I was curious, we had nothing, why did they join? And the most common response was the governing body. That we have a very impressive governing body and it's incredible what names can do. 
uh, we have the directors of NCBS, JNC, IM Bangalore, IIIT, uh, I think the deputy director of ISC, you know, people like that, Kiran, all of them on our governing body. So that really uh, sort of gave us a good uh, a start, you know, a reputational start. Um, so here we are stuck in this mall and it doesn't either look like an institute, feel like an institute, this looks and feels like an institute, you know, this is what we're used to. So it, we did an analysis after a few years, eight of the first 11 faculty whom we hired left. You know, it was just not a place attractive to good people and whoever came, you know, after a while they just left. But I think uh, somewhere, you know, we felt that no, we can build something. It will take time, but we can build something. And uh, personally, I, I think I got something from my father, uh, that attitude. <clears throat> so he was a sociologist. And at one point he had said that, you know, a lot of scholars study Europe. And they say, you know, there were many civilizations. There was the Chinese, there was the uh, Indus Valley, there was Egyptian, Mesopotamian, etc. Many places around the world where civilization arose. But Europe came to dominate it, uh, the world for many centuries. And, they, and he said the reason was that they built institutions. So the Catholic Church was a very important institute and you know, then they built universities, etc. The first university I think was, if I'm not mistaken, in Padova in Italy in God knows 1400 something, I'm not sure, but something like that. And all of you know, all of us know that you can do very little with one pair of hands, but with an institution you, you can build. You have a synergy and you also have institutional memory so that you don't repeat mistakes and you actually grow. And, and somehow that, I absorbed that without consciously thinking of that. So anyway, somehow we all felt, yes, we can do something uh, with this. So we muddled along and uh, so as I, you know, as I said, I had stopped doing science. So initially I was just doing admin. I did everything, you know, people tell me I'm good at multitasking. So for those who are good at multitasking, there's a value, you know, there's a market value, so to speak, for that. Uh, I didn't know we had to create files. Everything was by email. In due course, people told me, no, no, you have to create files. So we created files. But, you know, uh, uh, recruiting students, admissions, finding them places to stay, signing checks, everything, you know. There's a software called Tally, which you use to keep track of finances. I had never heard of Tally, and I was supposed to operate Tally. And at one point, I told Kiran, you know, I must have expressed some apprehensions. And she said, common sense, yeah, common sense. She has a very deep voice, okay. And I realized that those words ought to be framed and put on a wall. Anything you do in this kind of institution building, it is only common sense, okay? It's just what, are, what is the circumstance and how do you react to that circumstance? What are the opportunities that come to you and how do you take advantage of those? And really it's common sense. So after a while I started feeling, you know, anyone can build an institute. And we, were, we are, I, I assure you, very ordinary people. We are not PMBs. PMB was a larger than life person. CNR Rao is a larger than life person. None of us was like that. We're just ordinary people, okay? Just, just putting one foot ahead of the other. Uh, but then in later years, I have realized it's not so simple. You need a certain attitude and a certain, you know, the institution is definitely above the individual and not to get bogged down by small pettinesses, but to think of the institute and think of the future and just, you know, try to do a good job. So that attitude is important. Everyone cannot build an institute. I've realized that now. Anyway, so, so in due course, we hired an administrator. And everything I was doing, I passed on to her. And I still didn't know what I was going to do after that. But you, know, you have to clear your desk. If you don't clear your desk, you don't know what else you can do. So at that time, grant writing became my major preoccupation. We were a new institute, we had to raise funds, we weren't sure where. We were given a five crore initial fund and we had no idea where any money was going to come when those five crores were over. So we wrote some grants and at that time DBT for instance said, no, we can't give you any money, you're not eligible because you're a private institute. So today DBT doesn't say that, but that was again a phase where different kinds of institutions were being formed and we, we fell outside the normal uh, sort of uh, boundaries of what institutes were supposed to be like. 
So I wrote a grant to the Vadhwani Foundation. Kiran had pointed us in that direction saying, why don't you think of this? Uh, which was a foundation, a US foundation, I don't know if they've come around here, but uh, set up by a very rich NRI, Romesh Vadhwani, and he wanted to promote entrepreneurship. And so I knew nothing about entrepreneurship. But what I said in the grant was that Bangalore has both a lot of entrepreneurship and it has a lot of very good bio institutions, and we have nothing here, but I'll work with them. We'll figure out something. And I was lucky and I got that grant. Um, and I was even luckier that a year later they renewed it. Um, I was yet luckier yet another time because they changed their strategy and they, forgot, they gave me my money and forgot about me. So I had all that money with me. But what they did was initially they had f identified five institutions whom they would fund and they felt that every year they will hire, you know, re uh, award grants to five institutions and that way they'll spread this culture of entrepreneurship in academia. Uh, and catalyze entrepreneurship in the country. And they changed their strategy by saying hub and spoke. They will build a sort of secretariat within Wadhwani and have consultants who work with institutions and that may be a better and faster way. So they gave me money which totaled about a crore and then forgot about me. It was like an HHM I grant, do whatever you like with it. And I was very happy and I ran my uh, research uh, which evolved uh, for several years on that money. Uh, and how I fell back into research was that the Wadwani Foundation sent across a business professor from INSEAD. INSEAD is a prominent uh, business school in France, but uh, this was the Singapore campus. And he asked me, so who's forming the biotech companies uh, in India today? And I said, well, the postdocs aren't doing much, but there are some people who are returning from abroad. And whatever little general knowledge I had, I, I sort of answered him. And then, uh, you know, I realized on my way home that, you know, I could actually draw up several categories of people. And ultimately, it was nine categories. And I said, you know, I bet this could be a paper. Um, and so I, I wrote up a paper. I didn't have to do any further research. I could just sit at my desk and figure out which company, how it was formed. And I sent it to Nature Biotech. So I'll just uh, pause for a minute to say why Nature Biotech. So Professor Bunsell had the right instincts of a professor of IIC. And she subscribed to Nature Science, Nature Biotech, a few things like that. And I remember laughing at that time to myself, saying, we have nothing here. What is Nature Science, Nature Biotech? What are we doing with these magazines? It was an empty place, 28 students and some three, four staff. But because the magazines were there, I lived through them, right? And so I think unconsciously, I got a sense for what the journal looks for. So then I said, all right, I sent it to Nature Biotech. And they sat on it for six months without a word. Reminder, 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 nothing happened. Finally, I get this no. And I was so angry by then. You know, you took six months and then you say no. So I wrote a strong letter to the editor saying, what do you mean not of general interest? That's the usual, right? I said, Nature just had an entire issue or, or section devoted to India. So how can you say India is not of sufficient interest? So the next day he wrote, okay, fine. I'll, I can take this part, I can't take the rest. I said, take whatever you like, take it, you know? <laughs> so the, I think uh, that analysis was, was useful. And I have a feeling later that DBT did something with it. Uh, I heard Dr. Bhan, who was then secretary of DBT, he liked my work. I had published uh, other pieces after that. And I have a f suspicion, I have no proof that it, uh, what I had shown, one of the things I'd said was that not more than 10% of the companies are formed by academics in India, like scientists coming out and forming companies from Indian academia. And I think they, they created a scheme uh, to enable that. I, I'm not sure. So, so now, OK, then the other thing, current science also played a very important uh, role uh, in my life. So again, because of CCMB, I had a great respect for current science. Uh, I think all the faculty read it. Uh, I think Dr. Gauri Shankar, who was a faculty then, through, from him, either directly or through my friends, uh, I got this impression that, you know, we need to build our journals. Uh, foreign scientists aren't going to come and build Indian journals. We have to build them. And current science is one of them. So, you know, I used to read current science and they had listed me as a reviewer for biology. I think I had reviewed a paper on toxins, which is what I had been working on. And after this Nature Biotech piece came out, I saw that I was listed as a reviewer for policy. I said, oh, is that what I'm doing? I didn't know. I didn't have a label. We never grew up hearing the word policy. So that was, it was very helpful to have that kind of a label. 
So then I said, all right, we're going to do policy research. We're going to do more of this. And I had the Wadwani money. So uh, there was a postdoc whom I hired. She wanted to move out of bio. She had done a PhD. And she, wa she was interested in patents. And so we, we did some studies on patents. Uh, and uh, again, those got a couple of them got published in Nature Biotech. And that's not as impressive as it sounds, because they had a special section for patents. So it's not like you're competing with every paper submitted to Nature Biotech. You're just competing with those submitted to patents. And they also have a special section on entrepreneurship. And I published some things there. Again, it's a section, so it's easier to get in. Anyway. Um, so, OK, to come back to, uh, uh, to the institute. So we moved to our campus, our proper campus, in mid-2009. So the earlier I started, we started in 2001. So it was many years before we moved. And now we look and feel like an institute. Uh, and uh, things have you know, just steadily gotten more concrete. Uh, you know, we have faculty now who have not left us. Uh, we have a grand total of 16 faculty. Uh, aside from 16 faculty, we have six staff, a grand total of six staff, other than you know, housekeeping, security, that kind of thing. So it remains a small institute. But uh, from a time where we had to beg for money uh, every year, we, we paid an enormous rent in the International Tech Park, and we received eviction notices because we had not paid our rent. But we beg and the government would give us money. Uh, now we have a reasonable corpus and it gives us some sense of, uh, you know, uh, solidity. Uh, and, you know, these new schemes, Ramalinga Swami, Inspire, etc., help to fund faculty, some of them uh, in their early years with us. So uh, I think we're, I sometimes say it's like that bacterial growth curve, that those, uh, the initial lag phase is really painful, but I think now we're on the log phase, uh, and it's much uh, more pleasant. Um, so we had another, uh, you know, there were other things which made the, the institute somewhat uh, irreproducible. Uh, after Professor Bunsell went back, she was just given three years from ISC. Uh, either you leave ISC or you come back, so she went back. Uh, we ha got Professor Yatindra, who retired from Madras University and came to us. And he has been, he was director for some 12, 13 years, and he came to us after retiring. So he has been a role model uh, in many ways, uh, full of energy. Uh, and, you know, he did a remarkable thing. He came and he looked at, so the first thing he did was to come and find that there was no money in the bank. Nobody told him that. He just came and yeah, you can apply to for funding to do policy research, okay? Um, and sometimes if you're going to, so I was just telling some of the students at lunch that, uh, or after that, that uh, currently I'm working on clinical trial registries. And there are a lot of problems with the Indian registry, the clinical trial registries in India. Um, and that, the, that organization simply will not engage with me. Um, and three years ago, I wrote a grant to DST. DST has one scheme which you could call a policy scheme. And they rejected it with the simple line, the data is publicly available, so you don't need money to do that research which is baloney. I mean, it's ridiculous. So it's very hard. And at one point, actually, I had given up. You know, what do I do? I can do interviews or something, but otherwise I can't hire. If there's no money, I can't hire, you know. So we have a strong need. And it always baffles me that in this country of 1.3 whatever billion people, we don't have more policy research. You need people to explore what has happened abroad, what is happening here, what could happen, do thought papers, do whatever. And in the US, for instance, you have so many many large bodies and numerous bodies which do policy research. We have an absolute, you know, dearth in this country. So, so it's, uh, you know, even if I say that, yes, policy is a viable option, there are, it comes with big constraints, uh, you know. Uh, in if I can just interrupt, do you think part of that constraint comes with the sense that if one writes about policy, there's a, a tendency to feel that one is being critical and therefore uh, there is a tendency to self-police and not yeah, actually make critical uh, thoughts available yeah. which are actually important for the yeah. growth of policy. There may well be. There may well be. So I recently published this paper last year on the some of the problems with this registry. And they got very upset with me. And they wrote this uh, big letter to the editor. Then I responded. And they, when I wrote to them after that, they did not respond to me when I wrote to them directly. And you know, it doesn't help to be the, a lousy registry. And it's not rocket science to fix that registry. We could do it. I, I said, why don't we collaborate and do it? You know, 
they won't do it. People get defensive about it. Um, so coming to Kiran, um, so uh, of course I didn't know her in her younger years. There is a book which uh, Seema Singh has written, which I've read with interest. Uh, she she's a force of nature. I mean, absolutely. She has this deep voice and and she has you know absolutely no compunction saying what she believes in. She's a tough cookie. She's tight-fisted. The tight-fistedness which comes where you have raised yourself by your bootstraps. Uh, you know, every rupee they had to earn themselves. Uh, so I should clarify that I have not been an entrepreneur. You know, just because you need these sort of categories. Someone who sets up their commercial enterprise is a sort of commercial entrepreneur, a business entrepreneur. Someone who sets up their own social you know, social enterprise is a social entrepreneur. I have been entrepreneurial, but I have not been an entrepreneur. And an entrepreneur is someone who takes on basically the responsibility for initiating and uh, an organization, raising funds for it, etc. So that distinction is important. Um, I'm not sure where she uh, gets her confidence and uh, whatever from. Um, I just know that uh, she had a small team, which uh, it has changed, but she had some very long-standing members of her team. And I've heard she gave everyone, including herself, the same salary. Of course, she had more shares, but the same salary, because she considered them so vital uh, to the growth of the company. Um, she has a lot of chutzpah. She can, she has absolutely no, comp you know, a lot of us sort of hold back a little. But if there was a crowd, let's say, to meet Obama or, or, or Manmohan Singh or anyone, she'd charge in almost, I would almost call it rude, charge in so that her picture is taken with them. And then she'll frame it and put it in her office. <laughs> okay? I've seen her office. I have been to social gatherings at her home. And you see all these framed pictures uh, with Obama and others. So she's, uh, she also uses hype. Okay? And I was very critical of hype. Uh, as scientists, I think it's the opposite of what we are trained to do as scientists. As, as scientists, we say, okay, what's the evidence? And what conclusions can we draw? And let's not go beyond those conclusions. We can speculate, but then we call it speculation. But hype is speculation and exaggeration, irrespective of the truth, or somewhat. Uh, but I can't be overcritical because our institute was born as part of that hype. So I have seen good things happen as a result of hype, including those 1,700 people who applied to us when there was nothing in the institute. So there is a certain value. I think she combines hype with, uh, with solid delivery. There are other entrepreneurs whom I won't name who have gone the hype route without any solid delivery. And that's just an empty shell rattling. So she has somehow come up with a, a balance of the concrete deliverables and also the hype. And she has used the hype, you know. She's very good at building bridges. So I think, uh, I'll, I'll come to questions, but I think IBAB was sort of the occasion when she started engaging with government of Karnataka more, then that grew to government of India, and then, you know, internationally. But she has been good at building bridges. Yeah. Nice talk and uh, beautiful to know about your experiences. So my question will be uh, kind of in continuation with Dr. Dhawan's and your uh, uh, explanations and all. But we feel that young people, young people, they are with a lot of passion and energy and uh, you know a lot of you know energy sort of thing. But sometimes uh, those need to be supervised by the uh, you know experienced uh, people. So, uh, what part do the institutes as a whole uh, try to do to bridge the gap between this younger generations and the experienced uh, people? Uh, what I mean to say, when uh, experienced people try to frame something, of course those will be really good, but sometimes listening to the younger generations, uh, for example in, in an institute, a lot of younger students might be having a lot of ideas, even in this policy making and all those things. Do the institute, uh, institutes in India currently try to uh, you know, get ideas from those as well or they just think, okay, fine, we are the enough people to do that. <laughs> I think, I don't know whether institutes are actively talking to young people to get their inputs. I don't know. Um, so, I'll, you know, you're young up to a point and then one is not so young. Uh, and someone once remarked that for an entrepreneur to succeed, 
you should be under 40 and you must cut off your ties with everything beforehand because then it's like you've been thrown into the swimming pool and you have to learn to swim and Kiran agreed with that I was in a meeting where they were saying this and in a sense I was like that I had cut off what I was doing before I had said I'm not interested in that I was under 40 I was still slightly under 40 and I was thrown into this new situation and now it was up to me to if not, I was not going to be the only one but an important member of the team making this succeed uh, I used to joke that my sole institute building experience before IBAB was our crash because we had this little crash on campus which the parents put together and they were hardly five six children it was very difficult to run the crash because we NCBS new campus was far from you know far from the town and people weren't willing to pay very much so how but unless I had a crash which worked I could not leave the house so we were very ingenious in how we made that crash work so when you're forced to it you find a way you know um, and I think you know increasingly there are the concept of mentorship I mean we've always had our guides our PhD guide our postdoc guide mentor whatever but the concept of generalized mentorship um, has spread more it's much more in the air now and there are a lot of people one can go and talk to so even in biotech entrepreneurship it used to be that you only had first generation entrepreneurs you never had a, someone who had built a company sold it or whatever and now starting a second one you now have those so you have experienced people whom you can talk to um, and like that I think uh, you know in every there may not be too many people but you know your CCMD network itself will give you access to so many people right your existing students, alumni, teachers, ex-teachers, everything. So I think the ecosystem exists. Yeah? But then, of course, it depends exactly what you're trying to do. Yeah. So uh, thanks for like taking us through your memory lane and enlightening with your experiences. So my questions come like with the like the bold decisions that you have taken in your life. So what kind of impact it has done on your social life Ah. and also like how it has like affected you in your harder times so those things yeah uh, good questions so I think uh, in fact it's an excellent question multiple questions uh, I tell our students chase happiness don't chase money now all of us need money there is n no one who doesn't need but at some point you have to say this money is enough okay and my spouse had a steady job he had a government job he was going to get his salary regardless we had been postdocs we had saved money so I felt I had that freedom not to earn and I think that was a very important uh, aspect of how I thought about things um, and you know sometimes as a woman one would say I must earn as much as my husband right why should I earn less and that's a good thought at the same time one can go one step further so if you think of let's say Narayan Murthy in Infosys his wife was a college teacher and he probably thought okay whatever she's earning is enough for the family let me try and try something else so don't get hung up about money okay unless one absolutely has to social life I don't have one okay uh, I think I work six and a half days a week because my spouse is doing exactly the same thing and I really have very few friends in Bangalore I have them in Delhi where I, which I left in 1986 when I came to uh, CCMB uh, we have a few definitely but we really don't socialize honestly uh, Dipankar Chatterjee he was a colleague uh, he was a faculty member here he once asked me so Gaiti you don't cook so how do you how do you entertain your guests I said I don't have them <laughs> you know so and he said you don't have them okay he understood that so I don't have a social life okay uh, but it's okay it's okay I enjoy what I'm doing hard times you know when you're in a so there's another thing okay another attitude issue in entrepreneurship uh, they, they this was of course the old days they said most people want to join an IBM and what they meant was the Google or the Facebook the respected uh, company um, and therefore it's a big step for people to join a startup which is nothing you know it has no reputation so today you'd say okay I want to join a CCMB or an ISC or something like that but if you think about it if you join a non a non-existent entity you can probably have more impact okay uh, but I should clarify that you know I I was much better at saying what I'm not interested in than at defining what I did want to do so I would say I'm not going to do XYZ uh, but I wasn't clear about what is ABC 
and it so happened that various opportunities landed in my lap and I I took advantage of those. But it's a risky path. There's no guarantee that ABC will fall in your path. There's no guarantee that you'll have enough support to be able to take advantage of them. So that's why I said it's an irreproducible experiment. It was a, it was a sort of particular constellation of things which happened, which I sort of, I grew with those opportunities. So, and you know, one of the things in India I have realized is persistence is one of the biggest uh, sort of predictors of success. Things, you know, our institute was muddling along, muddling along, muddling along for many years. But somehow we felt we can do something. And if you wait long enough, you know, maybe the environment changes or, you know, you do build up a certain reputation that you're doing a good job with the students or whatever. Some of our students did exceedingly well. A couple of them are sitting on the last row here. And so we do have that reputation now. Uh, NCBS and STEM have signed an MOU with us. They want five of our students every year after they finish the master's program to work on big data projects. Uh, we have a few things like that going. Uh, so I do feel, uh, you know, Novartis comes from Hyderabad to hire from us every year. So we have a good reputation for our education. And now we have to strengthen other aspects. That has just been one aspect. Yeah. All right. We shall have one more question. Anapurna. Hi, it was great listening to you. Uh, so I have a, a sort of general question. So we are talking about science policy, we are talking about other unconventional career paths. And there is conversation happening in institutes like CCMB and others, but it's still not part of regular conversation. So how do we increase that? Do you have any tips for that? So various organizations are sort of organizing these alternate career days. Uh, so I have spoken at NCBS, I have spoken at JNC, and there are a range of things, right? Scientific communication or uh, various things which people, journalists, science journalism, etc., people come and talk about. So I guess that's one of the things. Um, uh, so it's not just about talking about things, it's also equipping yourself with skills for these other opportunities. And I think, uh, you know, all of you now by definition have bio-related skills. Um, what are the other skills that you may need? Uh, and one of the things I wanted to mention, since I suspected I might face this question, is the issue of handling big data uh, and programming. Uh, we have recently started, I'm not here to sell our course, but I'm just telling you, we have recently started a course called a Postgraduate Diploma in Big Data Biology. Uh, one batch is over, it's a one year program. Uh, and we had a student in the first batch who came from VIT. He left his PhD midway, stopped it, came for a year and has gone back to his PhD to uh, get those skills which presumably he either needed or he thought he would need after that. And I think this year we have a student who has come after her PhD to join the course. So uh, I have a couple of postdocs now who both wonder what they're going to do after this. Uh, there are a limited number of postdoctoral fellowships or post postdoctoral fellowships which they can apply to. And the only thing I can think of is to tell them learn programming and learn R and you know a few things of how to handle data. Because I do believe that that will be uh, useful whether or not you continue in biology those are skills which have wider applicability but again you know I was talking to several students at lunch and they have such a wide variety of interests the point is how to convert those into careers and very you know Finland in Finland it's the most prestigious thing to become a teacher the most and there's huge competition to become a teacher unfortunately that's not the case in India here it's the IT industry so if you go to the IT industry you're sure to get a good salary so everyone goes to the IT industry if someone would give teachers good salaries everyone would want to become a good teacher and we need we need a huge number of good teachers so I don't know you know uh, you can talk about it you can bring people in to talk about it and then think what you would you like to do and then uh, so somehow develop those competencies maybe on the side yeah. all right uh, i personally believe that uh, the entire talk as well as the discussion would have seeded uh, more perspectives in the minds of the audience uh, thank you very much for that uh, dr sabawal so uh, now, as a token of appreciation, I, I request our director, Dr. Rakesh Mishra, to come up on the stage and hand over the caricature made by Sudipto, and I ask Sudipto also to join the director.
थैंक यू सर